There we are. Good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Steve, and it is good to be with you this morning. I would say top of the morning to y'all today. Well, that's what we call Southern Irish. Um, I hope that you'll take some time to look through the announcements. Wow. Um, and join us in lots of different things. Notice especially the insert about the Haven Totes fundraiser that is coming. Janice Parks was going to be here to tell us more about that, but she got snowed in in South Dakota. It's what you get for going to South Dakota in March. Um, but she will be with us next week to tell us more about that. But we hope that perhaps you'll put that on your calendar and get that set so that you can join us for that special fundraiser for Haven Totes. That's the program where we take food for the weekend for the kids at Kelland Elementary School, and it's worthy of your time. Um, speaking of Saturday, how's that for a transition, right? Um, moving from the flea market this last weekend to Market on the Move this coming Saturday. So it's the fourth Saturday of the month. It's a day that we help with this program called Market on the Move. We put out fresh fruit and vegetables that comes up from some of the other uh, growers out of Mexico and uh, allow the community to come up and get very inexpensive produce. So we need your help. The program runs from 8 to 10 on Saturday morning, but we need some folks here by 7 o'clock to set up the tables and set out all the fruit and vegetables that will come that day. So if you can help us on Saturday, we sure could move, use your help. Speaking of markets, golly, the flea market is over. <laughs> Almost. Y'all need to join us tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Because tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock we finish up boxing the leftovers so the Salvation Army can come on Tuesday and take them away as we begin collecting for next year. Um, but also we have to put all the tables and all the tabletops away. And that's a lot of work. So if you are at all available tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, we really need your help. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. I thank all of you for all the help that you gave us. Uh, but I want to introduce to you the leaders of the group. The, uh, oh, no, wait. There's a video first to watch. Um, let's, let's watch up on the screen a little recap of what happened this weekend in the flea market. How long have you been coming? For the past three years. Wonderful. So you, you buy stuff, you find stuff. I was just walking down the aisle. And? No, but how did you find the flea market? Oh, uh, I know Betty Lou. All right. We have three generations three here. Three generations. The Meldings here shopping at the flea market. Yay! We stuff that we donated that we'll end up buying back. I think that's a perfect idea. How we do that. Well, thanks for being here, yeah, all of you. We also have food trucks today, and we've got John and Johnny here. I shop here every year. Oh, how long have you been coming? As long as it's been open. Since 2013. Yeah. For us to discover how things went for us. So let me introduce to you the lead team of ladies of the flea market. Come on over ladies. Good 
morning. First and foremost, we want to thank all of you for your help. I look around and I see that several of you were there, but one of the groups that I personally would like to thank are the people that fed us. We have had lunches brought in on the days that we were working and then during the actual flea market, all the volunteers were fed. It was wonderful. We have some amazing people in this church and they were great. And I think I can speak for all of us when I say yum, it was good. <laughs> And again, thank you very much. I'm just going to pull the mic down a little because I'm a little shorter than Donna. But um, <laughs> I want to thank you also on behalf of the team. I know we are all extraordinarily grateful for all the help that you've provided throughout the year. We start again in May. Um, pricing. We start the first week of May because of Mother's Day this year instead of the second. But... Um, we also will have a thank you dinner next Sunday, a week from today, at 4 o'clock, starting at 4 o'clock till 6 o'clock, and we'll provide you with food. This time it'll be us providing you with food, and um, we'll have some games, and we'll have some door prizes, and hopefully a good wrap-up fellowship time like we've had all year long throughout the flea market with all your help. Thank you all. And I want to thank you for all your donations. They have been wonderful. And I have to thank another person because when your donations are too large for you to bring in, that I take my little pickup truck and I get my friend, <laughs> Ben Thurston. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and I have to raise it because I'm a lot <laughs> taller than Pam and Vera. <laughs> um, we had a, I mean, to me, every year it's a su success. It isn't only the money that we, we raise, it is the fellowship, it is the community some service. We just meet some of the neat, neatest folks do, doing this, and it is a way to connect with the congregation within your, your church too. So if you can even give us one shift each year, that's great. It does take everyone to make this thing the success that, that it is. And it was, once again, a huge su success. At this point, and there will be some more coming in, but at this point we have raised, and the, this is gross before the cost, 46,5908. So we will be over 47 by the time all, all is said and done, which is better than pro prior years. Um, the cost is go going up. We did start to take credit cards, which was great, so there is some fees with that. And of course, we um, hire more, more help because it just helps us along because as we do grow older, um, it does take some of the younger help. So, but even that, to, to me, is part of the, the mission of the, the church that we can hire and help others within. So um, thank you all so, so much, and we look forward to next year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Did you notice the calendar on, inside your bulletin? And what happens at noon? <laughs> so we figure all those leaders ought to be taking naps today. Uh, they have worked very, very hard. Uh, and I'm grateful for everybody putting that together. Let's get ourselves ready for worship. I invite you to take this moment to center yourself in God's spirit. And each of us on our own. Let's take this moment to pray and be in the music of prayer. Let us pray.
In the season of Lent in the church, it leads us to the cross and to the tomb. And yet every Sunday we come to celebrate the resurrection. It's a mixed season of us, for us, of sadness and of joy, of knowing our own part in leading Christ to the cross and in knowing God's part in saving us from the consequence of the cross. So we come this morning to honor the one who was crucified. God incarnate in this Jesus, who shows us the most incredible love there could ever be. Whether you're able to rise in body or in spirit, let's join together in praising God in our opening hymn. Let's pray together. Great and mighty God, you are amazing. And we come before you humbly and yet boldly to praise you for the love that you show us by allowing us to be a part of this world, giving us life even through the breath that you breathe into us. And for the promise of being with you through the breath you breathe to us through your spirit forever in your heavenly realm someday. Thank you. We come before you as a people who want to show your love and grace in all our lives, but know that we don't. There are times when we still make mistakes, time when sin is still a part of leading us away from you. And we are very sorry for that. And we ask your forgiveness. But even while we ask, we know that you're already providing it that you're always willing to give us yet another chance. Help us not to take that for granted and just keep doing what we're doing. We give to you all of our faithful moments, just as we give to you our unfaithful moments. Because we know this life is not about us, it's about you and what you're doing in and through us. Help us during this time of worship to tune in again to you and your word that we might then broadcast who you are in Jesus the Christ in the ways we speak, in all that we do, in all the ways that we live so that your honor and your glory will be praised by all creation someday and by each of us this day and this week. 
For we come to you in Jesus' name. He's the one that we follow to you. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. be seated. We have an incredibly faithful ministry that goes on behind the scenes here in our church called the Compassion Connections. It's a group of volunteers through the church who have agreed to come alongside us, alongside each other, to pray with and for each other, to visit and keep people connected, particularly those who may be homebound for any reason. And I'm grateful for all those who are part of that. Um, over this last year, as Pastor Brownson retired, we decided to hire a couple of part-time people. One is Jordan Cullop, who oversees all of our audiovisual. He's up there in the corner every week. Um, the other is Debbie Anderson, who's with us today. And she goes out and helps us keep in contact and connection with people who are homebound or perhaps in the hospital um, and keeps them connected to the church and comes alongside me in all that pastoral care. And Debbie helps to guide and lead our Compassion Connections. And we invite Debbie to come forward to bless all of those in that ministry. You want to come up here so they don't have to maneuver the steps? Good morning. It's such a blessing to be a part of this ministry and, and this church community. It's just absolutely awesome. Uh, I would like to call up the team of Compassion Connection. If you could come up here, please. And while they're coming up, I think Kathy Wade wanted to say something really quick. You don't have a microphone. Yell. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, we have been blessed by this compassion connection. And I just wanted to share a personal experience because they have been in need of our body. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, all of you, for being here today, and thank you for being a part of the ministry. It's just wonderful. We have over 20 people who are participating in this ministry, and I have to tell you about one other that's an honorary member of our group because she is on the VIPP list. Do you all know what VIPP is? Visited in person people. Um, Freddie Fredericks, we go to visit her and we write her and we uh, keep in contact with her and she is so touched by the ministry that she wanted to be a part of it too. So she uh, volunteered to do some writing of cards for us. So we're just so tickled to, to have her doing that with us. Okay, as a group, we have completed our basic training, if you will. Our, our training is ongoing, but our basic training has been completed and all of these folks have made a commitment uh, to participate in the Co Compassion Connections ministry. Compassion Connections team, do you confirm your commitment to actively participate in the Compassion Connections ministry by serving in all or some of the areas of connection, visitor on call, connection in person, Connection through written communication, connection by phone, or connection through sharing communion. 
Do you understand the importance of strict confidentiality, commitment, ongoing training and reporting? Do you understand the need to share certain information with the coordinator of congregational care and or the pastor? Do you always, do you, will you always promote the love of God in Jesus Christ throughout your ministry? Will you, the congregation, agree to support these folks in their ministry? Let's pray. Gracious Creator God, you are amazing. Thank you for the gift of loving. Thank you for giving us compassionate hearts. We are so blessed to be a part of your ministry, this church, and the beautiful creation of human beings. Be with us as we live into our commitment to serve one another in your name. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, that we may serve one another with meaning, love, and compassion in a way that is pleasing to you. Help us to trust in you, to know what to say, what to pray, and when to be there to just listen. We know you are always with us. Help us to share your love and your ways with those we serve. These things we ask in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You are making connections to the most vulnerable, most frail of our community. We entrust you to go and serve these people, and we thank you for your service. Go and serve. Thank you. Thank you.
How beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you for your ongoing giving to the life of the church. Through our annual budget, we help to support ministries like Compassion Connections and others that we develop when we see the need. And your regular giving to that general budget makes all of that possible. And I thank you for that. So we invite you during this time of offering to sign in on those red guest books that are somewhere in the pews and to be a part of the offering in whatever ways are right for you. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here this morning in this sanctuary that is so safe and feels so safe to be in. Guide us in the use of these monies, that this congregation will use them to proclaim peace in all the world. So we pray for those in New Zealand whose lives were taken in a mosque. Surround their families with your spirit. And somehow may the church proclaim ways of living in peace with all as we live in peace with one another. For it is in your name that we give and in your name that we live. 
Amen. You may be seated. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. In these weeks of March, we're taking some worship focus on who is this God? What, what is this Trinity? And it's a difficult concept for us to understand. It, it has been for generations. The proclamation that there is only one God, yet three persons in that God, is rather confusing. But important to remember that we as Christians believe that there is one God that we know through many kinds of relationships, but particularly through the relationship of God as Father, God as Son, and God as Holy Spirit. Last week I began talking about God who is Father, or also known as Mother, who is really that parent, that giver of life in our lives, who who oversees the creation, who creates the creation, who makes all things possible. That is that Judaic tradition that believes that there was one God in the midst of traditions all around the world that believed that there were multiple gods, gods of this and gods of that. And yet they proclaimed there was just one God. Which got really then confusing again when the person of Jesus came to the earth who claimed himself to be Emmanuel, God with us, at one with the Father, Jesus would say. And that began to confuse the people who said, well, okay, now maybe there are two gods to whom we pray. We we pray to this great God and we pray to this great Jesus as if they were two. And the church said, no, they're the same. Now, in all reality, I think sometimes we overthink things. We try to explain things that we will never, ever understand. We are human beings who have a finite set of knowledge. And amongst all the things that we have learned, amongst all the things that we have discovered, and amongst all the things that we will probably yet learn, as great as we have become as creatures in this incredible universe, there is a whole lot we will never know while alive as human beings. Our minds are so limited, the finite cannot fully grasp the infinite. But we try, because we want to understand, we want to be able to explain. So over the years, we've kind of developed within the church this sense of God as Father, and yet this Jesus, who proclaims now to be the Son of God. And over the years, through art, through growing up in the church, these are kind of some of the ways that I've begun, uh, that I was taught to understand this. And I've always seen God as that old guy with the white beard, and Jesus being the younger reflection of him, the son with the darker-haired beard, and of course the presence of the Holy Spirit in that dove-like form. I've always had that sort of sense that that's how it was. That God the Father sat on the throne while Jesus sat on his right hand, which always confused me. Why would he sit on his hand? (laughs) Which is really kind of an old English term of really saying he sat at his right hand. Which I also found confusing, and yet I lorded it over my two left-handed siblings. Because I'm right-handed. And obviously God favors right-handed people. Right? Because that's the place of honor, was at the right hand. Now you learn later on in some of the traditions that the right hand was the hand used for greeting and welcoming each other, and the left hand was used for sort of those unsanitary kinds of things in our lives. And so you always offered your right hand, and besides that, the predominance of people were right-handed, and so it's always favored. Does that mean left-handed people are less favored than right-handed people? No, it doesn't, okay? It's just at the right hand of God the Father Almighty sounded more fabulous, written by a right-handed person, okay? 
But there Jesus was, sitting on the right hand, or sitting at the right hand, of God the Father Almighty, waiting to judge the quick and the dead. He began to see that in the artwork, um, that this God the Father oversaw Jesus the Son, and this weird hand thing that means peace, and yet that sense of trinity, I, I don't know. Um, And then we came to understand Jesus born as a baby. That Christmas season that we talk about and sing so joyfully about. That Emmanuel, God with us in this human form. How can that be? Spent three years in seminary trying to write papers about how we proclaimed as people of faith in this Christian tradition that Jesus was at the same time 100% human. He had a belly button, folks. I'm sure he wet his diapers. Those are things we don't like to think about, right, with Jesus? I bet he burped. And I'll stop there. <laughs> but we proclaim in his birth that he was 100% human, and yet he was also 100% divine. Now, the last time I checked, it's pretty hard to understand how something, some one being, could be 100% this and 100% that. Last time I was taught, one plus one is not one. So I spent three years trying to write about it, tomes of theological understanding, and I still don't get it 30 years later. Okay? It's a concept that's very difficult for us to understand, that this infant was born as a holy person. And so we also, in our artistry, give him that wonderful halo, which must have been very difficult at birth. <laughs> right? But what we try to understand in that proclaiming him also divine is to proclaim this Jesus was the Son of God. Remember in this whole story, Joseph is just really kind of an outside player. You don't see him very often in artistry, right? It was God, the Holy Spirit, who made this happen within Mary. Okay? And so this Jesus is different than you and me. His birth was different. His birth needed to be different in order for him to be different than you and me, in order for him to be God incarnate. Though he had all the body parts of a human being, he was still divine. There was something completely different about this Jesus than anybody who had come before and that anybody who has come ever since, and we believe than anybody who will ever be. He was at the same time a human being, 100%. He ate and he walked. He clipped his fingernails. And yet he was 100% divine. He was God incarnate. Over different cultures, you'll see different faces of Jesus as artists paint him in ways that they try to understand in their own cultures. To relate to him as God tries to relate to us. And so artistry changes how you perceive who this Jesus was as the Son of God. Many, many artistry, particularly American artistry, portrays Jesus with blue eyes. Think about that. Jesus was a Palestinian Jew, a Nazarene, a Middle Easterner. Rarely, very rarely, will you find anybody with any shade other than brown or dark green in their eyes. And yet the artistry tried to paint them in ways that we relate to them. This is the artistry with which I grew up. In our dining room, we had Solomon's portrayal of the head of Christ. This is how I grew up imagining Jesus to be. He was beautiful, right? with long hair that I still envy. Right? 
that I never got to have. You know the little story about the young guy that went to his dad, and dad's like, you need to cut your hair. Um, but the kid wanted, the, the guy wanted to grow his hair long, and, and dad said, well, go read the Bible about Jesus. And the kid came back and said, yeah, and Jesus wore a gown and had long hair. And his, um, really what the kid was asking for, I was messed up the joke. Um, <laughs> the kid was asking dad for a car, and they had to cut his hair, and didn't want to because Jesus had long hair and wore a robe. And dad said, yes, and he walked everywhere. <laughs> right? Uh, to go back to my notes. <laughs> anyway, this is how I saw Jesus growing up. And yet this may be a little bit closer uh, to perhaps what he looked like. And we really don't know. But what we do know is that he came from that Palestinian Jew, Nazarite sort of tradition where people had that darker olive skin, that darker hair and darker eyes. Grew up the son of a carpenter, so more than likely he was strong-bodied and knew how to drive a nail and put things together. He was a handyman of sorts. We know he knew how to fish when other fishermen couldn't find fish, right? This has never quite been my image of Jesus, but as I was uh, searching the internet for pictures of Jesus, I came across this one. Um, if you were with me last week, you know he really should have Abba written here, uh, which we talked about last week being father. Um, he could have mother there, uh, because we talked last week that really God the father is really about God the parent, uh, and understanding God as mother is the same as understanding God as father. The reality is, it's really confusing to understand how this God, who's great and infinite, could come into a finite form. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a little bit later, of what that means to me. But over the years, the church has tried very hard to explain that to people. Uh, remember, as the church really began to form, really in the substantial way that it did, and get enculturated even into the governments that were around, people were confused about whether there was one God or two. And so the early church leaders began to write creeds to help people have statements of faith that would help them understand who this Jesus was and how there was only one God. The Nicene Creed was probably the first one written. And it tries to explain this trinity of how there are three and one and one and three. And there are some focal areas on Jesus being the Son of God. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. Do you hear what they're trying to do? They're trying to give us a theological understanding that this Jesus was no ordinary human being. He was not made, begotten, where'd it go? Down, there you go. He was not made, he was begotten. You and I are made, like others are made, from the dust of the earth and from the life of our parents. He was begotten through the Holy Spirit. He was God from God, light from light. This Jesus was no ordinary person. And the Nicene Creed tries its best to give you a theological understanding that this Jesus, though, was in human form, was still God in human form. Not that he just simply appeared human. He was human. Not that he appeared to be God-like. He was God. And those two have to be held in tension somehow without full explanation. Again, I think sometimes we try to over-explain what we'll never understand. The Apostles' Creed was written just very soon thereafter, the Nicene Creed. And it has a section focused on Jesus. It does a little bit different focus as it tries to explain him. We also believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. This is a very familiar uh, creed to most of us who grew up in the Protestant Presbyterian Church. What this one does, in my opinion, is try to give historical uh, accuracy to Jesus. When did he live? Under the rule of Pontius Pilate. We know from public writings that Pontius Pilate was a ruler in the area of Israel at that time. We know when he ruled. And so when they use stuff like this, they tell really more about his life as a human being, born of the Virgin Mary. Oh, born of what? How do you do that? So yet he was born of human beings. He was born differently than you and I. And they talk about what he endured in his life, what went through in his life. And indeed, there are lots of historical writers who write about this person of Jesus, who did miraculous things. But when you give it a creed, a statement of faith, you talk more than just what he did, you talk about why he did. We'll get to that. More recently, in the mid-1980s, a new brief statement of faith was written for the Presbyterian Church. Early in uh, the Civil War, uh, in this country, the main branch of the Presbyterian Church split over the very issue of slavery. Um, as the North and the South in our own country split, so did the church. And the church in the South began to proclaim that it was okay to have slaves, and the church in the North said that's the most unchristian thing you could think about. And the church itself split. The church wasn't really, in those two branches, were not brought back together until the mid-1980s. When that happened, a new brief statement of faith was written in celebration of coming back together into a denomination now that we're a part of, the Presbyterian Church USA. In that beautiful brief statement, which I absolutely love, it's one of my favorites, we'll talk about more, we'll use more of it next week when we talk about the Holy Spirit, is this wonderful part about Jesus, and it's a new shift. It says, we trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Now, what I see different in this brief statement of faith in these uh, 1900s when it was written is that we're moving from a theological explanation a need to fully understand how he can be fully human and fully God to just simply stating it. And talking more about now in the brief statement how that belief affects our life. Okay? By what he did. He preached good news to the poor, release to those who were in captive. He taught, he healed, He ate with people nobody else would eat with. He forgave people's sins. And he called people to repent and believe the gospel. Really, when you get into the brief statement of faith and you begin to proclaim Jesus as the Son of God, this person who was fully human and fully divine, what you now have is an emphasis on what that does in your life and what that means for you in more than your head but in your hands and in your feet. Isaiah proclaimed long ago to us something that we always speak of and sing about in the time coming into Christmas. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. That Old Testament prophecy came true in the person of Jesus. When Jesus went into the waters for his baptism and came out of the waters, he heard these these words. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. It set us up in the understanding that this Jesus was more than just God present. This was God's son. And more than God's son, this person was God incarnate in our lives. And this Jesus has all sorts of names by which he's known, all sorts of roles that he performs in our lives, but he is different than anybody else. He is different than anybody else in this world. This Jesus was a human being. Yes, he was a man. 
Does that mean God is male? No. Could God have incarnated as a woman? Absolutely. But at a time when patriarchal culture was in rule, when the men most, uh, in most cultures ruled, it made sense, I guess, for him to come as Jesus the Son. Could he just have easily come as Juanita the daughter? Absolutely. Would it have made any difference to us? No. Because the maleness of Jesus does not describe the maleness of God. The very fact that God incarnated, incarnated as a human being to be with us is what it's all about to me. You see, to know Jesus, is the Son of God, and not just the Son of God, but God incarnate, tells me something incredibly important in my life. That the great God of all creation is willing to love me so much that this God will become completely vulnerable, like I am, to show me that love. That this great God who made everything not only is willing to have, but wants a one-on-one -on -one relationship with me. Always has. And always will. When you read through the scriptures, you begin to realize that God walked and talked with Adam and Eve in the garden. He spoke their language. They talked to God. God wrote to Noah in a rainbow across the sky. God spoke to prophets and to people by writings on the walls, through words of prophets, both young and old. Over and over again, you see in the Old Testament, God coming to the people to say, I want a relationship with you. And sometimes the people get it and have a relationship with God. And then they say, there's no way that's possible. God will never relate to us. God is so great and beyond us that God would never understand how hard it is to be a human being. And God said, oh yeah, watch this. and came into our lives to show us how much God loves us, how far God will go to have a relationship with you and with me. And I find that humbling and inspiring. The God is more than just a father who sits above watching and waiting for a mistake, but knows exactly what it's like to stub your toe and be a human being. And I love God for that. But it's more than that. It's more than the inspiration that God is willing to come to this world and be like me and be with me. It's the deeper understanding of how this Jesus affects my life, that he is my Savior. The only one in all creation who knows how to lead me to God. And I know he knows that because he gave his life for me to have life. You see, I still sin. I did this weekend. There were a few people who came to our flea market who were um, I hope they never become members of our church. They were just mean and nasty sometimes. People are like that. They want to take advantage of you. They want to be mean. And so I'd walk around and told a few people, I'm putting on my Jesus filter. Because what I was thinking inside was, I hope, not what was coming out my mouth. You know those moments with other people? Right? 
But because I have given my life to Jesus as my Savior, I know that therefore I must be like him and learn to love. And that is not always easy for us human beings. And yet Jesus shows me it's possible. See, Jesus doesn't save me from sin. I still sin. What he saves me from is the consequence of my sin, that separation from God. Because there is no way this unholy being will ever be allowed to be in the full presence of that which is fully holy. But Jesus makes it possible. When he took on the burden of my sin on that cross, because he didn't do anything wrong, I did. I would have just been like his disciples, running and hiding, betraying, denying. I still do it. But when he was raised from the dead, upon whom did the stone fall when it was rolled away? Nobody. You've heard me say this before. You're going to hear me say it again. I got 13 years till I retire. Get used to it. Okay? It is the most significant part of my faith. When Jesus emerged from the tomb alive again, he did not come out with fists ablazing to get back at those who had crucified him. He did not come out with fingers pointing of shame, saying, see, I told you so. When he went to find his disciples and they were behind a locked door, he walked through the locked door. And he said to them, and he said to everybody, nothing, nothing, nothing will separate me and my love for you, from you. Nothing. And my God, who made me, has come alongside me to show me how loved I am. And despite the mistakes I have made, am making, and will make, that God will still love me. And I find that nothing short of amazing and humbling. And doggone it, you'd think I'd get it and live my life in a way that says thank you in every moment. But I don't. But when I know not only God as Father who watches over me, I know God as son who's willing to come and take on my life and take on the consequence of what I mess up in life and how I betray and turn away from God. I know incredible love and grace in God. And I can't help but over and over again, not only weekly in worship, but daily in my prayer life, turn my life over to God through this Jesus and proclaim him my Savior and follow him as he leads me to God. And I invite you to do the same. Let us pray. Precious and holy God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We don't understand how all of this is possible, but we are given our lives to you, proclaiming Jesus as our Lord and our Savior and following him as he leads us to you. Hear us as we pray, uniting ourselves together in the prayer that Jesus gave us as our way of being like him, praying the prayer he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We rise to sing the story of Jesus. I danced in the morning when the world was begun And I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun And I came down from heaven and I danced on the earth At Bethlehem I had my birth Dance then wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance, said he and I'll lead you all in the dance that you be. And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. I dance for the scribe and the Pharisee, but they would not dance and they would not follow me. I dance for the fishermen, for James and John, they came with me and the dance went on. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be. And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. I danced on the Sabbath and I cured the lame. The holy people said it was a shame. They whipped and they stripped and they hung me high and left me there on a cross to die. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. And I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. I danced on a Friday when the sky turned black. It's hard to dance with the devil on your back. They buried my body, and they thought I'd gone. But I am the dance, and I still go on. Dance then, wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. They cut me down, and I leap up high. I am the life that will never, never die. I'll live in you if you'll live in me. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. Dance then, wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. Jesus will lead. He is leading. Let him be your leader because he is our Lord and Savior, the Messiah of all creation. He is God come to us to be in our form to show us it can be done. To not only show us the way, but to be the way. So give your life to God through Jesus as your Lord and Savior and follow him as he leads you home where you will find peace forever and ever. Share that peace with one another before you leave the sanctuary and with everyone you meet till we meet again. Live in peace. Amen.